Hi everyone, and welcome to the second episode of What the Fandom. The second episode, or episode two. In movies, it's the one where characters get developed, relationships are tested, and the inevitable plot twist. The Empire Strikes Back, Two Towers, Godfather Part Two, Wrath of Khan, T2, Aliens, and of course, the great Jaws, The Revenge. In television, it's the one after the pilot where one of the actors are replaced without explanation, production values get a bump, and the table gets set for an epic run. In this episode two, you're still stuck with me, Katie Wilson, but we build on episode one with a new fan cast. This time, Fan Expo's Ansley Newland takes on Bioshock, and we return to tropes with a closer look at star-crossed lovers. We will introduce a new segment called The Great Debate, where YouTube sketch comedians and self-professed Jurassic Park experts Chris and Jack debate who would be better in a crisis situation, Alan Grant or Ian Malcolm. And in this week in comic history, we look back to June 1982, when a toy got its own comic and went on an epic run of pop culture popularity. For this week's trope, we are taking a gaze at star-crossed lovers, a couple whose relationship faces seemingly unsurmountable odds. Family disputes, political taboos, even supernatural forces, the star-crossed lovers are anchors in today's pop culture. Most famously a term in reference to Romeo and Juliet, as it gave the trope a name, but it was predated by such tales as Lancelot and Guinevere and Tristan and Isolde, just to name a few. It is often misconstrued as love that was meant to be, but the truth is these couples are doomed and do not normally enjoy a happily ever after together when it is all said and done. Pop culture is littered with these tales. The Doctor and Rose, Anakin and Padma, Cloud and Aerith, Jack and Rose, and of course, Buffy and Angel. Or Buffy and Spike. It's complicated. Who are some of your favorite ill-fated couples ever to grace our screens and pages? As always, let us know below. While not traditional star-crossed lovers, comedians Chris and Jack are also doomed. Doomed to argue about their favorite topic, Jurassic Park. This week on What the Fandom, we bring you a new segment called The Great Debate. Please welcome Chris and Jack to convince you of who would be better in a crisis situation, Alan Grant or Ian Malcolm. Hi, everybody. We are Chris and Jack of the YouTube channel, Chris and Jack. I'm the Chris one. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, I'm a silly guy that makes silly sketches with my buddy Jack. I was in Blue Man Group for a spell. I'm a juggler. I'm Jack of Chris and Jack. Uh, I'm also a, a, a voice actor. I was the voice of Sokka in Avatar The Last Airbender and uh, some other stuff. We're Chris and Jack of Chris and Jack. Uh, and today we will be uh, debating a fiery topic from the world of Jurassic Park. Who would be a better leader in a crisis situation, Alan Grant or Ian Malcolm? We feel particularly qualified to discuss this subject, both as individuals that regularly are in a crisis, <laughs> emotional crisis, yep, yep. Um, but also as uh, the preemptive Jurassic Park experts, because um, I'm sure <laughs> you all know, I mean, who doesn't, um, of the lauded and fully embraced into our popular culture holiday, July 6th Park which is yeah, the holiday we, we invented. On this debate, where where do you which side are you landing on, Jack? I'll be I'll be assuming the role uh 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 pro Malcolm. Okay. Easy. I'm taking you are pro toast. Malcolm. Pro Grant right. here. Go maybe ahead. Maybe I'm a maybe maybe I'm a traditionalist. Maybe I'm just like, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a basic Jurassic Park fan here and I get that probably you're gonna have like oh have you ever thought about it from this angle and if you really think about it Malcolm is kind of he's kind of like what no we're going with the 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 through and true leader and hero of the Jurassic Park world and the one not Jurassic World the Jurassic Park world yeah nobody's and... coming in with some Owen Grady shit in this okay nobody's, no no no, nobody's no, no, no. we're bailing that no, 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 no. I, uh, I, I, I mean, I just feel like Grant is such a such a clearly defined leader in a crisis situation for a number of reasons. If I may mm -hmm. uh, lay them out, I feel like you're gonna have to. I must. I suppose I'm gonna have to. You won't just accept that. 
That's not no. enough for you, Jack. <laughs> Damn. It's not that the screenwriter, it's not that Kep just like made it that he's the hero and that's enough and we're good. I'll 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 concede I would concede that argument if there were one movie, but there's there's a couple, so you're gonna have to <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I will say I will say that okay, so I feel like Grant as a as a leader he's great in a crisis situation because he's an every man that's learning as he's going, but works well with others. I think Grant is someone that works about well with kids? others. Not kids. That's what I'm saying. Though. Not kids it. yet. Not kids yet. He has, he has a trajectory where he, he has a lesson to learn. Yeah. And when someone has something to learn and they're not only in physical new territory, but also emotional new territory, I feel like that's a person who is suddenly pulled out of whatever their, their, their like, scar tissue of thought that had been built up to that point is this, this is a person that's freewheeling that's going off of instinct. And I feel like this guy has the best instincts that one could have um, beyond the instincts that have been built up in dinosaurs for 65 million years. To quote you earlier, my argument for Ian Malcolm is, but have you thought about it from this angle? Ian Malcolm, like what? Here's my point. <laughs> Ian Malcolm, Jurassic Park. He's a he's a chaos mathematician who seems to be there to to specifically not be a form of leadership. He's there as a poke holes guy. He's there to say like, hey, this seems weird. This seems weird. This water moves cool. What's that about? Uh, he's not trying to assume a leadership role, and he wouldn't be good at it. And he's not ready for that. Okay, he gets his leg injured. He's lying on the ground. He's uh specifically unhelpful. I would argue in the first movie, specifically unhelpful. Mm -hmm. Throw that Ian Malcolm out. I'm talking about Lost World Ian Malcolm. I'm talking about guy who's been in this shit before and is so, he's just a new guy. He, he enables people to play to their strengths. His daughter, Kelly, beats a raptor with gymnastics. <laughs> that's leadership, right? Like, I he mean, empowers I, people. That's a point I can't argue. <laughs> The answer is Ian Malcolm. For the record, there is a lot more in this video. We will be uploading the full version next week. Let us know who you think won the debate in the comments below, and you can catch more Chris and Jack on their YouTube channel, Chris and Jack. Trust me, it's worth a visit. And now for this week in comic history. Back in June 1982, Marvel Comics with partners at Hasbro published a comic book based on a toy and created a pop culture phenomenon. That book was G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero. It was the first comic ever to be advertised on television, and that resulted in a steady climb in subscriptions until it became Marvel's most subscribed title in 1985. Soon after, an animated television series would catapult G.I. Joe into the pop culture zeitgeist. Every house was filled with Cobra Commander, Duke, Scarlet, Destro, and every kid had a favorite between Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow. A larger toy line, a handful of video games, two live action movies later, G.I. Joe is still relevant today. The Snake Eyes origin movie is set for release this summer. Now you know, and knowing is half the battle. I bet back in the late 80s, people were fan casting who would be the best actors to play their favorite Joe. Well, Fan Expo's own Ansley Newland has been doing the same with one of her favorite video games, Bioshock. Here is Ansley with her fan cast. What's up, Fan Expo fam? My name is Ansley. I am your programming coordinator here at Fan Expo HQ, and I am here to fan cast Bioshock the movie. Released in 2007 by 2K Games, Bioshock is a first person shooter game that takes place in the underwater city of Rapture. The player is the protagonist, Jack, who travels through the destroyed city, trying to figure out what happened here and how to get out. In 2008, Take-Two Initiative partnered with Universal Studios to produce a Bioshock movie, but unfortunately, the film was canceled in 2013. However, Bioshock fans like myself still dream of a day when we will see Rapture on the silver screen. Until then, here is my fan cast for a Bioshock movie. First up is the founder of Rapture himself, Andrew Ryan. Not a fan of big government, Andrew Ryan founds his underwater city to get away from government oversight and interference. Along the way, he convinces the world's leading scientists, artists, and businessmen to join him. When casting this role, I thought it was important to look for someone who not only could play a good villain, 
but was also very charismatic because if you're going to convince someone to move to the bottom of the sea, you got to have a little charisma. So look no further than John Slatterly. John Slatterly is a fantastic villain from 1991's Homefront to his recent foray in Fox's next release in 2020, but he's also got spades of charisma. Madman fan, you will remember him as the ad executive Roger Sterling, and MCU fans, you know him as industry titan and showman Howard Stark. If you've got an actor who can combine charisma with moral ambiguity, I think you can't do any better than John Slatterly. Next up is Frank Fontaine slash Atlas. All right, spoiler alert, but guys, the game's been out since 2007. Frank Fontaine is the main villain in a cast full of villains. He is a ruthless criminal mastermind who is responsible for the civil war that took down Rapture. But we first meet him as Atlas, the hero of the people that guides Jack through his steps in the underwater city. When casting this role, I looked for an actor who can play both villain and friend and came up with Mark Strong. Mark Strong is no stranger to villains, from Stardust's Prince Septimus to Shazam's Dr. Shivana. The guy can do a masterclass on characters you love to hate, but he's also great when it comes to playing the mentoring friend. Look no further than his role as Merlin in the Kingsman series, where he takes a young Taron Egerton, or Eggsy, under his wings and guides him through his journey to becoming a member of the Kingsman. So for an actor who can be both friend and foe and turn on a dime, look no further than Mark Strong. All right, guys, that's it for me. What did you think? Was I right? Was I wrong? Well, that wraps up another episode of What the Fandom. Let us know what your thoughts are, your segment ideas, and of course, your fan cast ideas as we're looking for fans to include in upcoming episodes. Don't forget to subscribe. I'm Katie Wilson, and I'll see you in two weeks.